Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Hope everybody had a nice lunch in the sun. Um, good. So I'm going to introduce a couple of frameworks that um, I've developed and find helpful in, in designing behaviour change interventions. And the starting point for this talk is that, um, as we all know, interventions are complex. Uh, they have several potentially interacting techniques that vary along many different dimensions. So they vary in the content or the elements or what we might call the active ingredients of the intervention. They also vary in many aspects of the delivery. So the mode of delivery, intensity, <coughs> duration, then who's delivering, who's receiving, the setting. And then finally, also they vary in the adherence to delivery protocols, so either the adherence to what's intended or in terms of digital interventions, the engagement of people with what's potentially there to be used. And um, this was 12 years ago that uh, Karina Davidson outlined these dimensions. We also know that um, interventions to change behaviour have had very variable effects. We just need to look at the Cochrane reviews of evidence or the, the NICE reviews um, to see that. And if we to improve our interventions, we need to, um, what I've called, unpack the black box of interventions. We need to know what, what's in those interventions, what are those interventions about in order to understand them. So what is in the black box? How do components have their effect? which comes back to theory that we were talking about before lunch, and how can we use this information to design more effective interventions? So rather, um, as I was saying about theory, also when you look, about, uh, look at interventions, um, their descriptions in the public literature are very vague and they tend to lack detail. And even when they do have more detail, um, those details can be quite inconsistent with varying terminology across different uh, groups, and I'll illustrate that in a, in a minute. So we need good, clear descriptions using language that's understood by everybody so that the same term is used um, for the same component. I and mean, imagine in medicine, if different doctors were referring to different parts of their pharmacological interventions by different labels. Firstly, um, the effects would not be very good, and secondly, their science wouldn't um, develop. So if we don't have this shared language, we're very limited in our ability to replicate. And as we know, one of the cornerstones of science is replication. So you can be confident that a finding isn't just a one-off. We're also limited in our ability to implement effective interventions. All those resources may have gone into developing interventions, gone into systematic reviews to synthesize the evidence. We've come up with something that seems to be effective, but if we don't have clear detail, then we can't implement what it was that was found to be effective. Also very limited in evaluating interventions or improving interventions. So, you know, it's the, it's the first step, really, of science to have really good, clear descriptions of what we're doing. When we think of the theory of evolution, um, Darwin began that by just documenting very clearly what he observed. So just to give you an example um, of the problem, if we take the word behavioural counselling, and often when we read uh, interventions, you don't get very much more um, than a sentence or two describing what behavioural counselling is. So here's one example. Um, in an American Journal of Public Health, the uh, behavioural counselling was defined as educating patients about the benefits of lifestyle change, encouraging them, and suggesting what changes could be made. Uh, here's another definition uh, from an article in JAMA. Feedback on self-monitoring record, reinforcement, recommendations for change, answer to questions, and general support. Now, I don't know which of those definitions you think is a better definition, which coincides with your understanding of what behavioural counselling is. To some extent, it doesn't really matter, because the main point I want to make here is that uh, 
the same word is being used in very different ways. And so if we're wanting to um, build our evidence about behavioural counselling or use behavioural counselling in an intervention, we don't really know what it is. Um, to give another example, um, contrasting biomedicine with behavioural science and taking the example of a smoking cessation um, intervention. If we take varenicline, which is the most evidence-based pharmacological intervention, um, here we have the intervention content. So if you get varenicline, if you, or Champix it's sometimes called, if you prescribe that, that's what you get. And if you get that, you get varenicline. Very clear, one-to-one -one relationship. The mechanism of action, I won't read it out, but hopefully even from the back you can read a very specific description of how that um, chemical is working. Now, when we come to behavioural counselling and behavioural support for smoking cessation is evidence-based, we look at the Cochrane Review, and Cochrane is the kind of gold standard of reviewing methodology. This is how the intervention content is described. Review smoking history and motivation to quit, help identify high-risk situations, generate problem-solving strategies, non-specific support and encouragement. So my guess is if we were all told to go out there and do this, and we're all video recorded, um, we'd all be doing very different things. Then if we try and think about, well, what's the mechanism of action there? You have a thing. That's what it is, or a description of what it is. Can you think what the mechanism of action is from that description there? Maybe you can, maybe you can't. But the Cochrane Review, there was no descriptions of mechanisms of action. So this is a little snapshot of where we are. And the good thing about this being so dismal is there's huge room for improvement, and we can do better, and we can advance our science much more quickly. So um, as a result of my own um, struggles with trying to do systematic reviews and um, try and make sense of um, evidence which was made up of very heterogeneous interventions. It was actually a Department of Health commissioned review on physical activity and healthy eating. Um, I just thought we need a way of being able to see what's in all these interventions so we can see what have they got in common, what are the kind of signals for effective components within them. And so began developing a methodology where we uh, described the content in terms of uh, behavior change techniques. And what do I mean by that? Active ingredients within the intervention designed to change the behavior. They're observable, replicable, and um, discrete low-level components that on their own have the potential to change behavior. In most interventions, they're used um, in combination um, with others. And just to say that this is very different than the mode of delivery, to give an analogy with cooking, the mode of delivery, which might be digital, face-to-face, -face, um, leaflets, is more like the cooking utensils. Um, but the content or the behaviour change techniques is the food ingredients. And often when you look at published reports of intervention, there's huge amounts of detail about various aspects of that mode of delivery that I showed you earlier, and often very little about actually what are the um, key active ingredients. So the first, first um, effort to do this um, resulted in 26 items, and it was literally inductive, bottom-up, um, trying to see what was in all these different uh, interventions. And you'll see some of them at the end, relapse prevention, stress management, motivational interviewing, time management. That's bunches of stuff. These aren't specific techniques. But in the published reports, there was no more detail than that. So that's why we had to use those labels. And any of those things could look completely different, depending on uh, what people were doing. In order to, to make this reliable, so that the same people were using the same labels for um, the same bits of uh, reporting, um, we developed really quite long um, definitions. Um, and there's one, and there's uh, another. Uh, so each, each one of these 26 had this sort of level of detail. And uh, myself and colleagues uh, went on to develop um, taxonomies for different kinds of um, behavioural domain. And actually the second one down, uh, the 40-item one on, on physical activity and healthy eating, this was a result of um, colleagues in 
Newcastle and Aberdeen phoning me up to say, we're not getting the same reliability. Could you come up and train us as to how to get the reliability that you published? And I said, well, if you're not getting good reliability, it's not a question of you needing to be trained. It's a question that what we've produced isn't very good and we need to improve it. So I got them to um, pool all the discrepancies. Where were the sources of um, unreliability? And as a result of that work, we obviously had many more reviews and uh, we extended it to 40, but the labels and the definitions are a lot clearer. So you know, all of this is work in progress. Um, this can all be improved. And then um, we developed ones in different uh, behaviours. But then what I realised is, I said at the beginning of this talk, the importance of having shared terminologies and doing things collectively. And what we were really doing was fragmenting the field rather than integrating it, so using d slightly different taxonomies for different literatures. And it would make much more sense to build on all of these, get the best of all of them, and come up with one um, longer and better uh, taxonomy. So I got three years of money from our Medical Research Council and uh, we had um, an international advisory board of 30 people who were selected from varying countries and domains and disciplinary backgrounds um, and, and came up with uh, this 93 item taxonomy. Um, and this applies to an extensive range of behaviour change interventions um, agreed by an international consensus to be the potential active components. So we actually had uh, altogether 400 participants um, in doing this work from 12 countries. So if any of you are amongst them in the audience, many thanks, and we'll be coming back to you for more help in the future. Um, and these were clearly labelled, defined, distinct and precise, so that we could use them with some kind of confidence um, by a range of disciplines and countries. Um, one of the things that uh, I'm aware of is that obviously this needs to be translated, um, both linguistically, but sometimes in terms of subcultures and different terms that people use. But what we're hoping is that people will start with this as the sort of skeleton and then adapt it, but again with cl clear rationales so people can see what was adapted and why it was adapted, so people can keep coming back to a call. And we call this, if you see, V1 for a reason. It's version one. Um, everything's a uh, work in progress. And on our new website, we're going to set up a portal so that people can feed back, because already people are telling me, um, and I know myself from having used it, that some labels aren't very good, some things people are having problems with reliability, but we can get all that information and we'll set up an international consortium who will review the evidence as it comes, comes in, and then in a few years' time, we can, on the basis of all of that, uh, develop a, a version two. But it means we can move forward as a scientific collective rather than being very frag fragmented. Now, 93 items is too much to hold in your head. The very first one was 26. You could just about remember all of those, but 93, no. So what we did was do some work to uh, look and see how people are grouping these when they, when they use them and um, came up with uh, 16 different groupings. So I'm just going to show you um, uh, just three of the 16 groupings and then I'll show you one of the, the definitions of one of these items. Um, so here we go. So that's just the top of, of the... Um, of, of what's in the article, actually, um, in Annals of Behavioural Medicine. But if you look at the top left hand, goals and planning, that was the first of 16 groupings. Okay, And in that grouping, there are nine behaviour change techniques. The next one along comparison of behaviour, there are three behaviour change techniques. The next one we call antecedents, there are six, and so on. So if you look at just the very first of the 93 techniques, goal setting behaviour, um, here we have uh, the definition, also specification of what it's not, so people don't get confused, and a couple of examples. <clears throat> um, an enthusiastic uh, PhD student, uh, Dave Crane, produced this uh, smartphone app, which is really useful because you can um, look this up by technique or by grouping, and it's got all the labels and definitions. So it's there both on iTunes and on, what's the other one called? Android. <laughs> um, so I think you just search for BCTs. And then also in the course of this work, 
you know, we really realise that this is it's difficult to do this. And I think it's really important as behavioural scientists that we don't dumb down what we do. You know, everybody behaves and sees other people behaving. Everybody's got their own lay theories about behaviour. Um, but it doesn't mean that what we do is easy. And, and doing it well is really difficult. Um, so what has become obvious, that the skill of identifying and correctly labelling uh, what people publish in reports um, is a very skilled job. And we, we were asked so many times to do um, workshops all over the world, and I've got a very small team, and we just couldn't do it all. So we've developed um, an online training, which is uh, free. So um, that's the URL, or if you go onto the UCL Centre for Behaviour Change, you can get it, get it through there. Um, and that was based on a lot of the, the, the workshops that we'd done. Okay, so what does this do? This provides an agreed standard method to describe interventions accurately, to design interventions, to evaluate. For example, we heard earlier about factorial designs. Um, so you, you can begin to identify which of these active ingredients in complex interventions are having a role. Because some may be very effective, some may be doing absolutely nothing, and some may actually be counterproductive. Um, so one can begin to do that. And I think somebody mentioned N of 1 designs too earlier, which is another uh, good way of doing this. And uh, also very helpful in systematic reviews, can begin to um, bring this together. And I don't know if people have read uh, NICE's um, National Institute for Clinical and Health, excellent, their um, reviews of behaviour change, but they use this approach to try and make, make sense of it. Okay, so earlier I mentioned there's two different kind of approaches to uh, designing interventions. Um, there's using formal theory that I mentioned earlier, um, but now what I want to talk about is using an integrative theoretical um, framework, the behaviour change wheel. Actually, I'm, I also said the theoretical domains framework, but unless anybody's particularly interested at the end, I won't just because of time. Better to have the time for discussing. But it's basically an elaboration of um, part of this. So, traditional uh, approaches to <coughs> intervention design. A colleague of mine uh, refers to the Islagiat principle. Now, probably none of you have heard of this principle. Um, it stands for, it seemed like a good idea at the time. And sadly, that's kind of quite like, a lot of people, including us, I'm sure, can see that we've all been there. So we can do better than that. So here are the, the steps. The first thing is understand the behavior trying to change and make a behavioral diagnosis. And I'd say if you take one thing away from this talk, take that away. Really start from understanding the specific behavior in its specific context. Um, because if you don't get that right, Nothing else uh, will follow. And when you go to see your general practitioner with a problem, you don't want to walk out of that with some prescription of what to do without the GP having done a very thorough examination and come up with a diagnosis that you have some confidence in. So the same with behavioral science as with medical science. Then make sure one considered the full range of options. So don't close down so quickly. Think about all the things that are out there that might be helpful. Use a systematic method for selecting the particular behavior change techniques you do, and then obviously evaluate so it's, a po so it's possible to accumulate um, in the future. Now here is a, a, <clears throat> a sort of diagram that can summarize the sort of headlines of what I'm going to talk about, not all of it, because uh, no time, but um, starting with understanding the target behavior, defining the problem in behavioral terms, really important, and lots of people don't do it. Actually, whose behavior um, are we trying to change? Uh, and what exactly are we going to try and change? And specify it in terms of the what, when, where, when, how, with whom, in what context, etc. The more specific, the more likely your intervention is, is going to be um, effective. And then understanding what needs to change um, to achieve the target behavior. So just define what you're trying to change, and then go on to think about um, how to do that. Um, often with any problem, somebody will come with a problem, you have a problem you're trying to solve, there are many different behaviours of many different individuals. We're all part of networks, and the behaviours um, that... Uh, our behaviours are all part of net 
networks of behaviours. We heard earlier about competing goals or facilitative goals, same with behaviours. So I always think, um, start off with a big conceptual map of the problem, where you put all the individuals who are relevant to this problem, directly or indirectly, and all the relationships between them, and then all the different behaviours within those individuals, so you can think about many different entry points to the system. It's all a system. Um, and it's often maybe not the obvious ones, which are the ones that are likely to be the best ways of entering it. So the kind of um, questions to ask um, in terms of thinking, where do I target here? Where do I start? Is, if I change this, what is the likely impact? Because changing different behaviours may have different amounts of impact. How easy is it to bring about change? You want some quick wins um, to begin with, to ensure that there's motivation either by the individual, by the, the team, by the service, whatever it is. And also we heard the word spillover earlier. Again, how, how much spillover or generalizability? If I change this in the system, what knock-on effects will it have, either good or bad? So, and there are other criteria, but these are kind of things to say, okay, where do I start here? Okay, so you've, you've isolated a behavior, and often it's much better to start with one or two things first and achieve change, maintain change, do that well, whether it's an individual or an organization or a service, than a scattergun approach. So often what happens is either an individual or a service or an organization gets to a point where they think, I can't go any on anymore, this is bad, got to do something. Every panics, runs around, and you end up with some plan, doing too many things, nothing's done terribly well, Change doesn't happen and people feel demoralized and you're in a worse position than if you hadn't even tried to change it. Really important to just start small and then build on success. So thinking about um, what needs to change, thinking about, okay, this will give us a, a clue. Why are behaviors as they are? And what needs to change for the desired uh, behavior to occur? Now, um, people often talk about determinants and determinants really limits it because determinants suggest um, that I'm only going to change the things where I already have some kind of evidence of predictive um, power here. But you may have ceiling effects, you may have lack of variance, and there may be other ways in to changing things than just limiting yourself to um, uh, what are called determinants. So I'm now going to uh, re-show the, the combi model that uh, Robert showed um, this morning. And the important point is just to think about behavior itself is part of a system and itself is a system. Now, my thought experiment, no point doing it, because Robert showed it to you this morning. <laughs> but I was going to ask you, well, maybe it's a test of your memory. <laughs> but behavior to change, what three conditions need to exist? And um, the uh, clue is in the... Um, C and the O and the M. So, do you remember it from this morning? C's? Yeah? O? Yeah, and M. Mo motivation. Yeah, great. Okay, and um, what, uh, what I've done here is, um, or what we've done here in this model, is uh, to further subdivide capability into psychological or physical ability. So psychological is um, skills and knowledge. Then motivation is the reflective, the more systematic, conscious decision-making um, and automatic mechanisms. Again, we've heard uh, people talk about implicit, I think, earlier. Uh, and then opportunity is the physical and the social environment. Um, now, you'll see here that these are all interlinked uh, by arrows. Um, some double-headed, some single-headed. And these are uh, systems. And this morning, somebody quite rightly said, well, what about the environment? You know, what about if you don't have a guitar, then you can't be a good guitar player, even if you're highly motivated and you've got lots of skills? Um, because this is missing. If any of these bits are missing, the behavior won't happen. So this is showing this model of behavior, which I think is the simplest kind of model one can get, shows that the opportunity needs to be in place. Now, the other thing I just wanted to use this to illustrate is this morning um, people talked about, um, I think, post-pandemic post, post 
volitional or post-motivational post and post-intentional constructs, um, as if there's a kind of a phase of motivation and then there's a the phase of self-regulation. This is really saying something very different, that these things are interconnected and they, they have um, feedback on each other. So that as you, um, for instance, uh, become more capable, as your skills and knowledge increase, so you become more motivated. It's not you do the motivation first and then you do the self-regulation. These things all have knock-on effects. And it may, if you think about this as a system, you may think, well, actually, to change a behavior, I know there's a motivational issue here, but given the, the sort of diagnosis of understanding this behavior in its context, um, you may decide that actually the better way in here is to increase um, competence and increase opportunity, and motivation will um, follow from it. So in terms of designing, you start with this understanding. You start from, OK, I'm going to make a diagnosis of my behavior in context using this. So I will have an idea as to what extent do any of the uh, following, and I'll put it in this, this way as a hub of the wheel, um, these aspects of psycho capability, opportunity, or motivation need to change in order to change um, behavior. So you have a profile. It may be you've just identified one of these. Maybe you've identified all six of them. And do draw on more than one source of information. Triangulate. You know, you can draw on not just questionnaires, but interviews, focus groups, also observation. And the more you can draw on different sources of information, the more confident you can be in your um, diagnosis. Okay, so on to designing interventions. Um, consider the full range of op options. Um, so I'm a great believer in framework, <laughs> frameworks making life easier. But one needs the right kind of framework. Um, and actually why I did this, again, was working in the Department of Health, where they kept bringing new frameworks up and asking me what I thought about them. And most of them were lacking in one or more of these. So one wants something that's comprehensive, so you don't miss options that might be effective. That's coherent, uh, so you can have a systematic method for intervention design. And that's linked to a model of behavior, so you can draw on behavioral science and your behavioral diagnosis. And importantly, that's usable by and useful to policymakers, service planners, and intervention designers. So this is where, as I said earlier, chaos theory might let us down as a framework to use for intervention design. So I thought, well, let's first of all look, do we have such a framework? All the ones I've come across didn't really tick those boxes. So I uh, did a systematic review um, and identified 19 frameworks across various different uh, environment, culture change, etc., as well as health. Um, oops, sorry. Jumped ahead of myself. Um, and uh, none met all these three criteria. So again, a bit like what I was saying with um, theory, there was lots and lots of overlap between these frameworks. So I thought, well, the obvious thing is just to take the best of all of them and, and kind of merge them where there was overlap. Um, now, this is published in Implementation Science. It's open access. So if you just Google behavior change wheel, you'll get to it. In the supplementary files are all the stages that I went through to uh, synthesize this. So what we found also was that there were two levels um, going on here. There were sort of direct, what we called intervention functions, and then um, policy categories at a higher order level. So here are the intervention functions, um, and there are nine of them. And basically, they boil down to these nine. So uh, the first, actually it's too small here to read. So I'm just going to put those up, and you can read them as I go around. Knowledge. No, it's too small to read, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, persuasion, incentivization, coercion, training, ena oops, enablement, modeling, environmental restructuring, and restrictions. So those nine intervention functions. Um, really summed up what were in the 19 frameworks along with the policy categories I'm about to show you. And we call them functions because if we take one behavior change technique, it may have more than one function. So if you take uh, the behavior change technique self-monitoring, for example, that could have an educational function. 
because you're learning something that you didn't know before. It can have an enabling uh, function. It can have an incentivizing function when you see the gap narrowing between your performance and your goal. Now, um, in order to think about which intervention functions to select, you go from your behavioral diagnosis using the COMBI model to select uh, various intervention functions. Um, so here on the left-hand side, you've got capability, opportunity, motivation, and then we've got the nine intervention functions. And colored in are the ones where um, these would be the relevant intervention functions to draw on. And each intervention function will have a, a, a range of techniques. Um, so to give you an example, um, say we wanted to increase participation in cycling to, to work um, amongst a group of employees. Um, the behavioral diagnosis um, would be employers are unlikely to take up the scheme because they don't have a bike to use, similar to the guitar problem. So uh, what needs to change is the physical opportunity. And um, the, so therefore you select the intervention functions, which in this case would be environmental restructuring, and then select the behavior change techniques. Uh, so there are two of them there, adding objects to the environment, restructuring the physical environment. Now, that's a very simple example, but just gives you an example of um, how to uh, do it. So the end result would be employees were given bikes to use and cycle racks were installed in the office car park. Okay, policies. There are seven policies here. So we've got uh, in environmental or social planning. These are, these are sort of higher order policies that really help enact um, or implement the intervention functions. Um, communication and marketing, legislation, service provision, regulation, fiscal measures, i.e. taxation, and guidelines. And again, a similar sort of matrix. These are all in the papers, so I won't um, dwell on them. Um, the behaviour change wheel, as you can see, I've just put up some examples of very, very different kinds of uh, situations um, in different countries uh, that it's been used in. Okay, so one's kind of done one's behavioural diagnosis, selected the intervention functions, um, then which behaviour change techniques uh, to select. In the behaviour change wheel guide to designing interventions, again, we did that on the basis of uh, not being able to run more workshops on this, um, there are, there are charts there where you see which behavior change techniques are appropriate for which functions. Um, but often if you take one function, there may be 20 or 10 different techniques and you need to think about, well, which ones are the ones that I should begin thinking about in terms of my intervention? Uh, so we've come up with a set of criteria uh, which we call the appease criteria um, again, in this book. Um, so the first is affordability. It's getting more and more acute. Um, can, can it be delivered to budget? Practicability. Can it actually be delivered? Is it practical? Um, effectiveness and cost-effectiveness. Uh, does it work? And the ratio of effect to cost. Is it acceptable to a whole range, usually, of stakeholders? These can be uh, the public, professionals, uh, political acceptance. Side effects and safety, does it have any unwanted side effects or unintended consequences? And finally, uh, equity, uh, which I think is a really important uh, issue. Will it reduce or increase the disparities in health or well-being or standards of living? And this is a concept we don't think about or use um, enough. Okay, so um, the, just to, to finish here, um, one can use these frameworks as I've been very quickly outlining, to design interventions and policies. So the COMBI model links the intervention functions linked to behavior change techniques. Our government, many different government departments are using this model. They really like it. Um, but what they're interestingly doing is use it to what I call retrofit. They're taking their current policies and saying, ah, well, what do our policies like, look like if we map them against the behavior change wheel? And are we missing some important uh, tricks here in terms of policy categories or intervention functions that aren't included? Also can provide a framework for evaluation to see you know, what intervention functions are actually changing uh, over time and to help structure um, the uh, systematic reviews. So in summary, key step, 
identify the target behavior precisely, who needs to do what, when, where, how, recognize that behavior is a part of a system of other behaviors and between people, make a behavioral diagnosis, because a good behavioral diagnosis is more likely to lead to an effective intervention, and target uh, many levels simultaneously. Don't just think one has to uh, stick to, to one. And that's where thinking about both intervention functions and where one has got access uh, to more policy level uh, interventions using those two. Um, certainly, the NICE guidance, um, one of their findings was that more effective interventions are those that target many different levels um, simultaneously and consistently, which um, isn't surprising. So, uh, finally to conclude, um, we've got great potential here, but that potential is only going to be realised um, if we ensure that our work is uh, informed by the science of behaviour change that we can draw on. Um, so specifying component techniques, using theoretical frameworks to accumulate knowledge and guide interventions, and then linking behaviour change techniques to theory, um, as I said this morning. And um, again, uh, thank you to uh, my collaborators and to uh, funders. And, oh. <laughs> I was just going to say that um, the UCL Centre for Behaviour Change, as I direct, has a lot of these resources all on there, so do go and visit. Thanks.